I don't know who killed Paul and Maggie Murdoch, but I'll tell you what we know about what happened on June 7, 2021. My name is Mandy Matney. I'm the news director for FitzNews.com, and I've been investigating the Murdoch family for more than two years now. This is the Murdoch Murders Podcast. On the evening of June 7th, 2021, 22-year-old Paul Murdoch and his 52-year-old mother, Maggie Murdoch, were found murdered on their 1,700-acre property called Moselle, which is about 60 miles west of Charleston, South Carolina. Around 10.07 p.m., Paul's father and Maggie's husband, Alec Murdoch, called 911. The phone call was released by the lead investigating agency in the Murdoch murders, which is the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED, about six weeks after the murders, on July 22, 2021. We're not sure what exactly made the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division release the 911 call now but we're gonna play it for you and we'll talk about what we're hearing and try to learn what we can. Forty-one forty-seven Moselle Road is a property that is in Colleton County, South Carolina, just north of the Hampton County border. We're assuming that the call routed to Hampton County 911 instead of Colleton County because the location is so close to the border. Okay. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. Uh, uh. Okay. And did you see anyone? Okay. Is he breathing at all? No. No. Is she? Sources have told Fitz News that Paul Murdoch was killed by two shotgun blasts, one to the chest and another through the arm and head. Maggie Murdoch died of multiple gunshot wounds by a semi-automatic rifle, according to our sources. Two weapons were used in the double homicide, which is highly unusual. Okay, do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, It's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay, and what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay, and did you hear anything, or did you come home and find them? No, man, I've been gone. I, I just came back. Last month, a Good Morning America journalist who spoke directly to the Murdoch family reported that Alec was taking his father to the hospital on the day of the killings. After that, he reportedly checked in on his mother, who sources say has dementia, before returning to the hunting lodge. But where is home to the Murdochs? I really haven't been able to answer this question yet. We know that the Murdochs sold their home in Hampton, South Carolina in April 2020. Maggie Murdoch's Facebook page said that she moved to Edisto, South Carolina in July 2020. Edisto is a beach town about an hour and a half southeast of the Moselle property. 
I know that Paul had an apartment in Columbia, South Carolina, which is the state capital and where he went to school. But I also heard that he was known to couch surf in the months before the murders. He was often in Charleston and he was there the weekend before the murders. Sources have also told me that Paul stayed with his uncle John Marvin, often in Okadee, South Carolina, about an hour southeast of the Moselle property. They were also known to go to the family river home in Okadee, South Carolina often. I say this because it seems like the family did not have much of a routine, and it would be difficult to ambush them. Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. It sounds like Alec is replying to a question right here, and that question might be redacted. It also sounds like Alec is moving around a lot in this 911 call. In some parts, you can clearly hear the dogs in the background, which means that he's close to the murder scene. And in other parts, you can't hear the dogs. Okay, what is her name? Maggie Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. Uh, We're getting somebody out there to you. Me asking you these questions don't slow them down, okay? And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? (laughs) Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them's moving. What is your telephone number? And does anything look out of place? Ma'am, I, I not not particularly, really, no, ma'am. Okay. So no one knows how they would react to a situation so horrifying as this. But at no point does Alec Murdoch ever mention that he's afraid of a killer being around. Granted, sometimes in situations like this, people feel so hopeless to the point that they don't care if someone else takes their life. And also, this is a redacted 911 call, and we're not sure what parts the police took out. So in this part of the 911 call, you'll hear a lot of clicks and beeps, but that's pretty normal for a 911 call, and we're keeping them in so you can hear everything that was provided to us. Okay. All right, I'm going back down there. Close, ma'am. Yeah, they're, they've been around with you ever since uh, you've got on the phone with me. I have multiple people coming out there to you. Right here, the dispatcher asked Alec Murdoch to turn on his flashers, but from what we've heard, he's not in his car yet. So we can assume here that at some point, Alec tells the dispatcher that he's in his car, and that part, for whatever reason, was redacted. Looking at the property, the dog kennels are about four football fields away from the main house. 
coming out six and one eight. You will need six and one five. Okay. Do you have your flashes on for me, Mr. Murdoch? Yes. Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? I I already touched them trying to get a um to see if they were breathing. Okay. Well, I I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? Oh. Ma'am, I'm going to call. I, I need to call some of my family. Okay. Well, well do me a favor for me. Whenever you see the officer or the medics, because they're, they're all coming to you. Absolutely. Here, the dispatcher asks Alec a favor, but something is redacted, and we don't know what it is. Okay, but we have them come in. Turn on the flashes on your vehicle so they can see you, okay? According to the Colleton County Dispatch Log, the dispatcher advised Alec to put in there's a three-letter word that's redacted, and then it says up when law enforcement arrives on scene. We don't know what that three-letter word is, and we're not going to speculate. You got the flashes on for me? I do. Okay. All right. Just whenever you see them. Okay. How old is your son? Twenty-two. Okay. All right. We're we're getting them out there to you. Okay. And I will answer if you call. All right. Nineteen minutes after Alec called 911, Deputy Daniel Green was the first to arrive on scene at 10.26 p.m. Within less than a minute, he determined that the scene was secure, clearing the way for fire and rescue to enter. A minute later, Colleton County Fire Rescue requested the coroner. So they arrived on scene of a gruesome double homicide, and they were able to quickly determine that the scene was secure enough for other first responders to join them. At 10.28 p.m., just 20 minutes after the 911 call was placed, SLED was contacted by the Colleton County Sheriff's Office. At this time, SLED's assistance was requested. Soon after the Colleton County Sheriff's Office arrived on scene at Moselle, SLED took over the case. SLED took over the case for two reasons. One, the complexity of the case was beyond what the Colleton County Sheriff's Office resources could handle. And two, the Colleton County Sheriff's Office had too many ties to the Murdoch family and rightfully recused itself from the case. According to the autopsy report, Maggie and Paul Murdoch died between 9 and 9.30 p.m., that's a short window of time, and we're not really sure how they came up with it. The next day, South Carolina media woke up to the biggest murder investigation in at least the last decade. A flurry of South Carolina insiders were texting each other news of the double homicide throughout the night. Soon after Fitz News broke the story, law enforcement quickly went on the record to say that there was no danger to the public. But here we are seven weeks later, and no arrests have been made in connection with the case, nor have any suspects been identified. Prior to the publication of the 911 call, nothing of substance has been released to the public regarding the direction or status of the ongoing investigation. In fact, SLED has been working very aggressively to plug any leaks related to this investigation. So what do we know? There has been a lot of speculation raised since reports were released last week, and those reports indicated that another person might be on the crime scene at the time of the murders. A lot of web sleuths pointed at Buster Murdoch and speculated that he was the other party at the scene that night. So what about Buster? He's been a big question in this investigation. This week, I confirmed with one of my sources that Buster Murdoch was in the Rock Hill, Charlotte area at the time of the murders. From there, we can conclude that Buster was not the other person blacked out from the investigation file. Alec Murdoch was identified by Fitz News sources very early on in the investigation as a person of interest, 
although he reportedly provided police with a quote-unquote ironclad alibi for his whereabouts at the time of the killings. But we haven't heard directly from Alec what that ironclad alibi was. He hasn't talked to any media since the time of the killings. We also haven't heard much from the Murdoch family since the time of the murders. During the Good Morning America interview, Paul's uncle, John Marvin Murdoch, said that his nephew Paul had been receiving threats from strangers since the fatal boat crash. However, John Marvin Murdoch told reporters he didn't think the threats were credible, and he said that the family didn't try to identify the people behind them. I have to note here that all of the boat crash survivors and Mallory Beach's family members voluntarily submitted to questioning and volunteered to provide their DNA as a part of the double homicide investigation. A source close to the situation told me that the Beaches and the boat crash survivors have not been questioned again since providing their statements and DNA. During the interview, John Marvin and Randy Murdoch said their family is misunderstood by the public. I see words like dynasty used and power. And I don't know exactly how people use those words, but we're just regular people and we're hurting just like they would be hurting if this had happened to them. No one is doubting that the Murdochs are hurting right now, but many are doubting that they are just regular people. The Murdoch family has loomed large in low country law for more than a century with three generations of its members serving as the solicitor, which is South Carolina's version of a district attorney, between 1920 and 2007. They also own one of the most prominent law firms in the state of South Carolina. So three weeks after the murders, Amanda Loveday, who is chief operating officer at a Columbia, South Carolina-based public relations firm called NP Strategy released a statement about the Murdochs having a $100,000 reward offered by the family in connection with the murders. The statement said that Alec and Buster Murdoch offered the reward. For a person to get this reward, they must provide information that leads to an arrest. But what's interesting about this one is that tips must be submitted before September 30th. So there is a deadline to this reward. So now I want to talk about the evidence, or lack thereof, that we know about in this case. So we know that Maggie Murdoch's cell phone was found along a rural South Carolina road just outside of the family's 1,700-acre hunting lodge the day after the murder. Sources have also told Fitz News that multiple guns were removed from the property the night of the murders. Considering the crime scene was at a hunting lodge, this is not at all surprising, and it does not mean that the murder weapons were taken from there. We also know that law enforcement impounded a 2021 Chevy Suburban registered to the Murdoch law firm from the scene. We also know that on June 16th, sled agents were collecting evidence in a swampy area approximately two miles south of Moselle, and we have no idea what they were doing there. Alec and Buster Murdoch were facing a massive wrongful death lawsuit, which their insurance company was refusing to cover them for, in the death of Mallory Beach. A hearing in that lawsuit was scheduled for June 10th, three days after the murders. That hearing included a number of motions requiring Alec and Buster Murdoch to fully respond to previous requests to disclose their financial documents, and asking the judge to have the case move from Hampton County to Beaufort County. That hearing could have also meant that Paul and Maggie Murdoch would be added to the lawsuit. So all of this means that Alec must have been under immense pressure with the lawsuit looming, combined with the fact that his father was dying of cancer. Randolph Murdoch III died at his home on June 10th, 2021, the day the hearing was supposed to take place. And we know that SLED has asked for patience and that a judge recently ruled that SLED did not break the law in this case by being selective of the information they've released. We have to wait on law enforcement. We have to give them time. And it's still early to judge in this case.
So on that note, we need more time too. I made this podcast for one reason, to expose the truth on another platform. But it brought on way more work and way more pressure than I ever imagined. Turns out, spending 99% of your free time working on a murder investigation is not great for your mental health. I can feel myself getting close to burnout and I cannot afford to get there. So I need to prioritize my mental space and I need to take a step back. We will still be doing podcasts, but they won't be every week because it's just been absolutely grueling on David and I. We will be back with more episodes, but we need some time until then. And my name is David Moses, fiancé, producer extraordinaire, and I may be a little biased here, but I believe that Mandy Matney is the most knowledgeable investigative journalist covering this saga and others in South Carolina. If you believe in her reporting like I do, subscribe to FitzNews.com. It truly has the most accurate and timely coverage of any news outlet. If you believe in our mission to expose the truth wherever it leads, please follow and subscribe to the podcast so you get an alert when we publish the next episode. Until we return, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at murdochmurderspodcast.com any questions you want answered. What do you want to know about Mandy's reporting? Are you curious about advertising on Fitz News or sponsoring the podcast? Drop us a line to info at murdochmurderspodcast.com. That's info at M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H murderspodcast.com. And thank you to all of you supporters out there that are leaving five-star reviews, leaving positive comments. It really does keep us going. Stay tuned to the Murdoch Murders podcast and fitznews.com for the latest updates in the case. Or follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Mandy, M-A-N-D-Y, Matney, M-A-T-N-E-Y. And don't forget to leave a five-star review unless you're going to be nasty and talk about my vocal fry. The Murdoch Murders Podcast is created by me, Mandy Matney, and my fiancé, David Moses. Produced by Luna Shark Productions. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>